here today talking to Professor Diane Harper. Diane is a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And Diane played a central role in the clinical studies associated with the HPV vaccines. Could you, could you tell us something about those vaccines and the effectiveness of HPV vaccines? Sure, there are two HPV vaccines that exist, and uh, we now know through trials that have lasted at least five years for Gardasil and eight and a half years for Cervix that they are 100% effective at preventing two of the cancer-causing types. Um, for Gardasil, it actually prevents a third type, 31, and for Cervix, it prevents three other cancer-causing types, so you get five cancer-causing type protection from that. So the evidence in women is actually very strong that it prevents those specific HPV types that cause both abnormal pap smears and eventually cervical cancer. Now, you've expressed some concern about using these vaccines, especially for, for younger girls. It, some, it's unusual for somebody who has done the studies and been a promoter of the vaccines to express that kind of concern. What, what are you concerned about? Yeah, I do believe that the vaccines can do some real good in the world, but what I'm concerned about is the fact that we don't know how long these vaccines are going to last. And um, as I said earlier, we have evidence for Gardasil that lasts for five years, and we have evidence for Cervarex for eight and a half. Those studies are ongoing for a full 10 years. But the modeling studies that look at real effects in the population show us that if these vaccines don't last for at least 15 years, then all we're doing is postponing the cancer development. We're not preventing it. And that's not to anybody's advantage. That's a really good point. And, and in, in addition to, to this effect, HPV, varieties of HPV, can do a lot of other things as well, correct? They can. We know that there are high-risk types of HPV and low-risk types of HPV. The low-risk types are generally associated with genital warts, but we're finding that there are some what we call low-risk types when you think about the cervix that are actually associated with cancers of the vulva and of the penis. Um, and so we really have more work to do in understanding how these types interact with different tissue types and with different mechanisms to cause cancer. We have the high-risk types of HPV, and those predominantly are 16 in just about every single one of the cancers. So we know it's in cervix, we know it's in penis, we know it's in anus, we know it's in vagina and vulva, and we know it's in head and neck cancers. So 16 plays a big role in those that are associated with HPV, um, but not the only role, just as it's not the only role in cervical cancer. Now, when you look at a population basis, of what the impact would be of a very broad, wide-scale vaccination, would, would it really decrease the incidence of cervical cancer? That is a really good question, and we have to look at this in two ways. We have to look at this from a population benefit of cervical cancer prevention, which what we currently have, the CDC data shows that overall, all ethnic groups combined, pap smear screening, no matter how imperfect it is and how it doesn't reach necessarily everyone, it still gives us an incidence rate of cervical cancer of eight per 100,000 women. Whereas if the vaccines were used without cervical cancer screening, the very best that we could get with Gardasil would be 14 per 100,000 women, and with Cervarex it would be 9.5 per 100,000 women. So from a population benefit, neither vaccine is going to be able to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer, except potentially in the subgroup of black women and Hispanic women where the rates are 11 and 12 per 100,000, and then that would only be for one of the vaccines. So the real question is, on a population basis, if women stop getting pap smears, our incidence of cervical cancer will increase. And we've seen that in models throughout the world, based on not only the US data, but we've seen it based on data throughout the world. So pap smear screening has been incredibly important um, from that. Now, 
if you look at it from a personal perspective, if you are someone who doesn't get pap smears and you don't go into your office or you go in once or twice in your lifetime, then having the vaccine may actually reduce that because your chances of cervical cancer are higher because you're not participating in the screening program. So we have to look at it. It's correct for the companies to say these vaccines prevent cervical cancer because they might, if they last long enough, in women who get the vaccines, but they don't necessarily become because on a population basis, it's not going to budge the number of cancers that we have as a nation. So I think that those are two different distinctions um, that we need to make. Mm -hmm. now, it, there are many other diseases associated with the varieties of HPV, as you mentioned. Well, what do you see as the future for developing vaccines that might be able to both be better at resolving the issues with cervical cancer and these other types of cancer as well. That's great. So there's two outer coats to HPV. One is the L1, which is type specific, and the other is L2, which is not type specific. And at this point, what we know from animal studies is the L2 gives an antibody response, but doesn't give a very big one, a little tiny minuscule response but it protects against all types of HPV. It doesn't compete with each other. What has been the problem in trying to put, well, just put all the HPV types in the vaccine instead, is that those types compete with each other and then you don't get efficacy for anything that you want. And so the trade-off has been, how can we combine maybe the stimulatory properties of HPV-16, which is very stimulatory, with the L2 to be able to create a pan-HPV vaccine, which would then be very effective for all HPV-associated diseases, and you don't have to worry about keeping track of which type and what percentages go with it. Now, short of that coming, the only other option we have is to continue to add L1 VLPs to the type specific, which is um, something that Merck is trying to do, but at this point, as you can see, you get smaller and smaller benefit for the greater number of types that you add. So there are some real problems with will this cause inhibition, will it really provide the same level of efficacy over time, and the biggest one is what is the time frame that the vaccine is going to maintain its effectiveness. Now, and the time frame varies depending upon gender. Correct? It does. That's what's very interesting. The new data that shows that we have protection in boys shows, or in males, I should say, we have protection against type 6 and type 11 in males, but we do not have protection against type 16 and 18, whereas in females we saw that we did have protection against all four types. So that's a really very concerning problem. The other problem that shows there's a gender difference is that the antibodies that are made by or induced by the vaccine Let's take HPV-18, for example. In women who receive Gardasil, 35% of those women lose all detectable HPV-18 antibodies in five years. But 38% of men lose all detectable antibodies to HPV-18 in only two years. So they lose that same, the same percentage of people lose antibodies three years earlier in men. The same thing happens for HPV-6 and HPV-11 where we do see protection in men. We see the loss of antibodies earlier. So the true question of duration of protection becomes even more important because their titers are dropping even faster and even lower than what we see in women. So those are issues that we don't understand why is there a gender issue, but it's there and it's clinically relevant and it makes clinical importance to women and men who are considering vaccination in the field. Well, I think this shows we have a long ways to go to perfect this vaccine. And what we learned from one vaccine can very well help develop new approaches for, for all vaccines. Absolutely. So oh, hopefully, if we have a chance to talk to you in a few years, the story will have moved forward and, and maybe improvements in human health will have res resulted. That would be great, Stan. Thank That's you good. very much. Stan. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay.